Scripture reading this morning is found in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11. And uh, we are in a, uh, I'd say, an especially rich uh, passage here. I don't know if one uh, sermon will quite do it justice uh, because there's just so much in here. But uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Maybe we'll come back and revisit next week. Uh, just because you, when you get to passages such as this, uh, you don't want to unnecessarily move through them so fast in order to get to the next thing and miss, I think, the grace of the real dig. And, and so um, we think through the passage together now as we read it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <clears throat> I remember, I don't remember where, but I remember reading uh, uh, kind of a funny but not so funny story about a church. I think it was, the, I think it was in Texas. And um, this church... Uh, had had basically divided in two, two basically warring factions, and things had gotten so bad that the one side had sued the other side. Okay, same church, right? Just imagine, like you're singing, and this half sues this half, and then this half decides, well, we gotta counter sue the other half. So <clears throat> one good-sized church, two groups of people suing each other. And uh, the, the case goes to a judge, and the judge decided that uh, he was going to let the denominational panel overseeing that church decide what to do with whatever it was they were, each side was seeking. And so they went to a panel, and the panel decided uh, on, the, on, on one side, kind of being in the right, I suppose. And Although, if you can get to that point of one side being in the right, I, I don't even know how they even get there, but that one side's in the right. So, uh, the media, of course, picks up on this uh, newspaper, and they decide to figure out, uh, well, what, it, what was it that caused this, this uh, incredible dispute with this church? So, somebody started kind of digging, 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 drilling, 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 and found that the beginning of the dispute happened at a dinner where one of the uh, elder members of the congregation was served a slice of ham larger than one of the teenage servers. The entirety of the dispute was over a slice of ham. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a minute. There must be some amazing ham in Texas. Uh, <laughs> but think about this. Okay, it, it's, so, it's so unbelievably, uh, it's just so amazing what can cause uh, strife, division, and a lack of un unity among uh, God's people. And, you know, when you think about, a, when you think, when you think about a, an instance like that, you think, oh, that, that's crazy. I mean, that's, that's wild. That's dumb. But, I mean, think about the slices of ham in your life, okay? Think about the things that have caused the divisions and disputes in your family, in, in, in maybe at work, maybe wh wherever it might be. Maybe you're not the perpetrator of it. Maybe you're on the receiving end. Maybe, maybe you have, there's a give and take of both. But just think about that for a second. Because when you really start to go underneath, and what you might find is that 
the things that has caught the thing that has caused division really is so slight. And if there was ever a way to to dial it all the way back, rewind the tape all the way back to the beginning, and just deal with whatever that slight was, you would save yourself so much of of headache and heartache. And I think when um, we come to Philippians chapter two, and we read this incredible passage, which is um, half practicality, half amazing theology. The real driver, uh, I think, as to the reason why this is being written, is that it's being written to save a church from dividing over things that are not worth dividing over. Because what you see in the passage, even before that, is this plea for standing side by side and being unified. And so Paul, from prison, is making sure that the people understand that you're going to have a two-front battle you're always going to wage, I guess, in a sense, because we're all sinners. The one, he's already made uh, plain that there's going to be opposition to the gospel from the outside that's going to cause fear and maybe some fracturing and harm because people are going to worry and wonder about whether this whole thing, this whole enterprise called the Philippian church is going to stay together. And I think to some degree, when we see what's happening in our world and the opposition to Christianity, we might kind of have that same fear. And it's, it's another, every time we we're faced with it, whether it's in the media, whether it's from something we hear, it's another opportunity for, pr for prayer that we would stay unified, we'd stand together, we'd hold the line. But there's another kind of battle that we wage. I think, it's we, I think we primarily wage it against our own flesh, which is the tendency to become disunified or divisive or just grow in discord toward other people, which really is birthed out of things in our own flesh that are actually very, very overcomable. If we would just humble ourselves. And that, I think, is the driving theme of what Paul is saying here in, in Philippians 2, that humility really is going to bring unity. If, if, you, if you like to boil things down to a very simple concept, it's this, humility brings unity. Humility brings unity. And it's not just a humble behavior like, okay, I'll just quiet myself, I'll, I'll, I'll berate myself, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll talk in, in positive terms about other people, I'll just, I'll make myself do this. No, there's a Christ-driven humility in the sense that it, there's a Christ-empowering humility when people truly reflect on who he is and what he's done for, for your salvation. When you think about his empowerment in your life, it ought to bring a humility because he was humble and took your place and died. And, and when you look to him for empowerment, you, when you look to him for humility, when you begin to think of others as better than yourself, as he did to lift them up and not you, then true unity in Christ can be had here in this life. Now, it's not going to be perfect, but at least it will be moving you in a direction, away from the ham slicers and in the direction of a people who say, you know, I find a lot of joy and the fact that someone else that is advancing in their promotion of Christ and in their living for Christ and their working for Christ, I find, I, I find myself taking great joy in that. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. That a Christ-driven humility will breed and bring that unity. If you think about it, if you just think about the tension and stress that exists We're going into the holiday season, around tables, at, in workspaces, parties, people that you think, I'd rather just avoid that altogether. Whatever those people might do is actually not my first priority. It's what's happening in my own soul in two ways. How I think about them, and then from my humble mind, what am I doing in my action? And I think the passage kind of breaks down on, the, on those two parts. That there is an exhortation to humility. How I, how I am humble in mind and then se secondly, when I think about who Jesus is, how his humble mind led to humble action. Because there's, there's one thing just to say, okay, well, I'm going to think about them better. Okay, I'm going, to I'm going to lift them up in my mind. But that actually doesn't go far enough. It's about what you're doing. And when you think about the humility of Christ, when you read verses 6 through 11, you, you'll see a progression that the humility actually, the, 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 the humility went into um, action, doing things. And it's an, a, I, I, I've read this passage so many times 
And I was reading um, a commentary on this passage, and it just it brought to light those verbs that, that, that's, that result from that humble mind. And I thought to myself, God, that's brilliant. I wish I had thought of that. I didn't. Okay, I got it from somebody else. But the, the, the amazing thing here is, is that when we reflect on who Jesus is and his humility, you can see it leading to action. It's the same thing that ought to happen for us. So when we just look at verses 1 through 5, what you see here is that it's a Christ-empowered humility that b- it begins in our mindset. I, I, was try- I was just thinking through, I was, I was doing word association on Friday with humble. I was thinking, okay, when I think humble, what do I think? And, and the first thing that came to my mind was humble pie, okay? That's silly, but it's just humble pie. And that's like, a, I think there's like, a, uh, well, I can divide the generations right now. You know, like there's a certain group of people that say humble pie, of course, you know. It's what you eat when you've been proven wrong. You have a nice big slice of humble pie. Okay, yeah. Well, some people don't use that. The other, the other thing that, that came to my mind after pie was brag, humble brag. Okay, and that's the other thing that people do nowadays on social media where they're trying to say something, um, but really it's a veiled attempt at, boasting, you know, and it's, it's kind of annoying when you read it, because you'll, you'll see someone, you'll see somebody post something, they'll say, oh, I love the colors of fall, what, what amazing creation, I saw that as I drove to serve at the homeless shelter, like, I didn't need to see that second part, I was just really enjoying the first part, okay, so you do it every month, big deal, you know, why, is, is it, what does that have to do with the colors of fall, you know, but it's, it's, it's like, it's like a way of, you know, it's, it's like a way of turning it. So just, just as a little bit of light shed on you. You know, people say, oh, that, man, my life is so busy. Oh, now that I got that great promotion. Oh, oh, all right. So you got a promotion. Well, is, I mean, is it about your busy life or is it about your promotion? Maybe it's more about your promotion. But there's just a way that people can turn even the most, like, nice, wonderfully sort of reflective moments into, into turning it back on us. And, th- and the thing is, we all do this. You know, it's, it's so easy to, to, to just open the window a little bit so the sun's shining right on this mug right here. And then, you know, people, they'll, they'll sort of look away from whatever it is, and they'll start looking at you. And, and I think where, where Paul is, is taking um, great encouragement is that he's, he's starting to see how the people are, are, are being empowered. And so as they are perhaps going through a period of discouragement, there is an encouragement when they see Christ, the power source, starting to build up the people. So he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, that's very important. This isn't just a nice thing to say because Christ is the power source now for the people. If there's any comfort from his love, any participation in his spirit, any, any of his affection, his sympathy, okay, so when, when, that com- when that's coming their way, he is the power source, then complete my joy. Make my joy complete. Make my joy in the midst of potential discord, complete it. Make it, make it to the uttermost, being in full accord and of, and of one mind. You see now, the encouragement that he has here is that there is a great temptation to, to splinter and break apart. But if there's any encouragement we're going to gain, the power source is going to come from him. The only way we're going to achieve true, true unity is by the fact that he is the one providing the strength of the bonds together. So if, if there's anything that can be done here, any kind of encouragement, it's from knowing that he's the power source. He's the one we look to when things begin to fracture. Look, there's, there's discord everywhere. And you know, there's, people like to stir the pot. People like to just, they just like to sow the seeds. Oh, did you hear about, oh, these two people over here? Oh, Really? Tell me about that. Well, I don't want to know. I just want to pray. Sure you do. All right. You're not praying. You just want to know. Why? Because we all like to watch a fight. Everybody does, even from being little. When two people are warring, we stop what we're doing and we watch. Remember the first fight I ever really saw was in high school, in the lunchroom, my freshman year at Shawnee High School. Two guys just got up and just started going at it. And I was like, everybody, whoa, forget about lunch. Do you see that? That's amazing. Why? Why? Because, like, our human tendency is, is to, like, be alienated and then to come together and, and, and bang heads. It's very natural to like that. It's very supernatural to be a peacemaker, to be someone who is unified. 
But Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because he was the one who made peace. And so for the people who stand with him, so they are the ones now who have the ability by his power to do the same. To do the same. Basis part of our nature tends to watch fights. The supernatural now uh, movement and power through the Holy Spirit is to overcome that and to be able to stand firm with people. If we're going to pursue a Christ-driven humility that's going to bring that kind of unity, we first of all have to see that the battle begins in our mind and the way we think about people. Do you ever notice? Do you ever notice this? You think negatively about a person long enough. Maybe you talk about them long enough. You, you tend not to look at them. It's, it's, it's hard to make contact. Where's the, where's the battle really being lost here? It's being lost in the mind. And that's why he comes back to this, to this the simple truth. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, and here it, again, here it is again, humility, count others more significant than yourselves. How am I counting others? In other words, how am I regarding them in my mind? Keeping the main thing, the main thing here, Paul had just made in the previous chapter, he, he made sure that we understood that if we're all in a war here, if we're all in a foxhole, and we're all supposed to be pointing our guns, if you like, at the enemy, that we don't start to turn them on each other and lose the battle and start to lose the fight in our minds as we think about really picking off other people because they're taking our spot. And so the battle starts to happen in our mind. That big slab of ham. Well, that was mine. Well, don't worry about it. You know, I'll, I'll bet there's more honey-baked hams in the back. If you just asked for another slice, you could have saved yourself an entire lawsuit. But, but again, it's so easy. It's so easy to lose the battle in the mind. And so when we start to think about it coming to humility, mo more often than not, I think it comes back to thinking of, of, of how, how, we, how we think and consider others and ourselves. I was just reading this morning. It was almost too late because I just was looking at uh, uh, Thomas Watson's A Godly Man's Picture, and he has a whole section on humility. And I found it so helpful. I thought, thank you, Lord, that it wasn't too late. I, usually in my life, I'd read it like after giving the sermon and go, oh, this was great. And he talks about, you know, when you think about in your own mind regarding others as more valuable or more esteemed than yourself, you can do that when you think about your reflection on your own sin. I thought, man, Thomas, you are killing me at like 7 in the morning. Of course. I, I look at, we just sang about it. You know, like, I, I look at the sin of, if you look at, we can look at the sin of our own soul and say, you know, there is nothing for us to be boastful, brag about. Of course that other person is going to be more highly esteemed. God's grace and goodness is, is more magnified in their life. When I, when I start to look at, yuck, what's happening here? And I, I don't, again, I don't mean it's like some kind of self-berating, but when we start to think about an honest estimation of our own souls, and we think about, oh, there's just a lot in there, it is humbling. And then we can think of other people and say, you know what? I, I, there, there, there's no way I'm, I'm sort of counting myself as somehow better than them. Because I've taken, a, I've taken true stock of my own soul today. And when he says, you know, do nothing out of vain conceit or rivalry then, if we start to think about that in our own mind, okay, what is vain conceit? What's vain glory? Well, wh what is vain glory? Vain glory is, is polishing the exterior because nothing's happening on the inside. Th this is like most of our culture. Everybody's vain glorious. It's all about image. It's all about the projection to the, to the public. And it's just like times a thousand now with, with uh, forms in which you can communicate that. But the point that he's making here is do nothing out of vain conceit and rivalry because, look, vain glory is a temptation for all of us. We all want to polish the exterior with really nothing happening on the interior. It's much more difficult to do the soul work and really do the hard work of rooting out the junk that's already down deep in there, it's much more easy just to put a polished exterior out there so that people might be impressed with us. And rather than competing against someone in your mind, polishing your exterior, lift them up, starting in your own mind. We, we had a saying at Parkside at the main campus uh, a little 
a little saying when it came to building a Christ-centered culture, and the saying was, pass the glory around. Pass the glory around. I really like that. It's something that's always stuck in my mind because the easy thing to do is to just take the glory for ourselves. The harder thing to do is to pass it and to let someone else be lifted up, receiving credit. And that, you know, trust me, you try and put this into practice, and if you're trying to do it in your own power, it's brutal. <laughs> because all the temptations take over. How could you say that? They, they, I did the work. I'm the one that ought to get the credit. I'm the one that ought to get the promotion. I'm the one who spends all the time with the kids. I'm the one who did this. I know. I know. If we let ourselves go that way, of course. It, it'll go down a rabbit hole we'll probably never get out of. But there's something that uh, takes over when we're so focused on ourselves. And so there's this mind sh shift difference. It's mindset difference. It's a shift. And so when you start to think about the shift, now the shift is, okay, now I'm going to start working toward pushing them up and myself down. David Brooks, in his book, a Road, The Road to Character, he says this about uh, this kind of self-centered mindset that often leads us away. Uh, and down this uh, trail. Self-centeredness leads in several unfortunate directions. It leads to selfishness, the desire to use others as a means to get things for yourself. It leads to pride, the desire to see yourself as superior. It leads to a capacity to ignore and rationalize your own imperfections and inflate your own virtues. We're constantly seeking recognition and painfully sensitive to any snub or insult to the status we believe we've earned ourselves. You know, when, when you think about that, even, e even taking for a moment a s just a stock, you know, how well am I doing when it comes to humility? Think about it in the way you receive correction, the way you receive um, reproof. You know, again, Watson, in that little book, A Godly Man's Picture, he mentions... Um, he mentions the story of the prophet Micaiah and uh, King Ahab in 1 Kings 22. And when Micaiah went to Ahab and confronted him over his sin, Ahab's response was, I hate him. I hate him. This is the normal response, to hate the person who brings the correction. But for the humble person, he goes, I hate it, the sin. There's a, dip, there's a huge difference between those two things. As we think about making progress in humility, the shift takes place from the person who brings the correction to the focus of what needs to be corrected itself. And when I look into my own soul and I start to think about what is it that really truly needs correction and someone else has seen it and pointed it out to me, do I hate them for bringing it out? Do I start to think more about them, think, think low about them, think bad about them? Yeah, that's the natural tendency. But the supernatural ability, Christ-driven humility, is to think about the soul process that, that needs to take place to root out whatever it is that behavior is. And so here, and what Paul is helping his people to think about now is the rejoicing that will take place as we start to see others as better than ourselves. You know, Paul's writing from a prison. He can't go and propagate the gospel. He can't go and speak it in Philippi. Somebody else has to do it. And he has great joy. He has great joy in the fact that the, the gospel is going out. That's what he's happy about. So it's not about him anymore. <laughs> you, see, you see again, when, when the focus is off of you and it's on the, the spread of the gospel, it's, it's, not about, it's not about the guy anymore. That's why he can take encouragement. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. And I can get, take, take great joy in the fact that these people have been rooted in Christ and now the, the thing is going out. Now the, the, the temptation is to, to splinter and, and break it all apart. But the power of Christ will pr provide an opportunity for the people now to do what he could not do. And he takes great joy in that. I think, I think that... A happy church is a church where people are being trained to go out. Talk, we just talked about it this morning. They're being encouraged to go out, spread the gospel in ways we never could. How many of us are going to do a 100-mile race? Anyone? Anyone? Driving your car 100 miles? Maybe. But think about it. 
We can pray and take great joy in the fact that the gospel is going out on those trails. And we can have as much a part to play in the participation of the spread of the gospel on those trails, even though we may never be on them. That's the point. Now, we can grow jealous and think, well, you, know, you should see what I'm doing. Whew. It's nothing compared to what I'm doing. Well, yeah, maybe. But you just, you just sort of lost the whole argument by pushing up yourself. But the point Paul is making here, the encouragement he gains, is that it's going out in so many different ways because it's not about him anymore. It's about the spread of the gospel. And so, have this mind among yourselves. If we're going to be a happy church, I think we're going to take a lot of joy in other people's progress. If we're going to be a sad church, we start looking at one another, getting into what I call compare despair, and seeing what other people have, wishing that we had it, and then trying to pull them down so that we might get it. That's what's going to divide a church. So what's building up this church now is the beginning of the battle that's happening in the mind. People will humble themselves. First battles in the mind, but humility then must generate itself in action. Who though was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Christ-driven humility generates itself in action. You know, there's a little part in, in verse 5 that I think there's a better reading of that than there's a little footnote in my Bible it says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus or which was also in Christ Jesus. I think that's better because what it's talking about, now the, sh the shift that is taking place is now solely on to Jesus. There's the exhortation and now there's like an illustration that the humility of mind that Jesus, Jesus had, that he possessed, didn't just stay there. He regarded, he didn't count yeah, though he was in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, he didn't exploit the, the special and prized um, position that he was in, in being the Son of God, pre-incarnate glory, receiving worship for all of eternity. He didn't exploit that advantage. Well, what did he do? He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. See, the, the regard the humility of mind and starts to generate itself in action. There's the verb. Made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Then that compounds in the next stanza. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This, this, this passage is, is just so rich. This, this is actually a poem. This is like a, an early Christian hymn. It's one of the best poems that's, that's, that, one of the best poems that's ever been written. Because of the way um, the stanzas all break out, there's, there's basically six containing three lines each. And Paul, if you like, when he was trying to write to the church about humility that's going to bring unity, he thought of this song, which gives me a lot of hope because I like to quote songs too. He just happened to quote like one of the best ones ever. And it wasn't like a poppy song that you would hear on the radio in first century Rome. This was the one that people were singing. So they would have been familiar with it. And what, what you see in the, psalm, uh, uh, in the song then is that Christ's humble mind worked itself out in humble action. The same thing ought to be true of us. But again, not in our own power. He's not just the example and the illustration. He's also the one who empowers people to do it. Because again, it says, which was yours or which was also in Christ Jesus if there's any encouragement in Christ. So he, he assumes that's who you are found in. The realm of that power is now your power to be able to move from a humility of mind to a humility of action. And then verses 6 through 11 just take us through who Jesus is. And I, I think what I want to do next week is just kind of dive more deeply into this. T today, today will just be the forest. Next week will be the trees. But 6 through 11 is about the humility of Christ. And just from a humble mindset, how it worked out into each um, humble action. If you think about it, it, there's a progression. There's this amazing progression in this poem. It starts up here. It starts its way up here. Though he was in the form of God, pre-incarnate glory, Jesus before um, incarnation, then he takes the form of a servant. He's born in human likeness, if you like. He's a little baby. Let's think about someone who's kneeling. Then he's in the form of human likeness, but he takes, uh, he, he takes that human likeness to the uttermost point. He's obedient 
to the point of death, even death on a cross. Just imagine this. There he is. He's, he's, he's laid down. But then verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him. What did he do after he died, after he was laid out? He was resurrected, exalted, ascended. And what is the, what, where is the humility in this? The Father's humble, perfect humble deference to do what? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above all names. Perfect humble deference. Jesus to receive the praise. Once again it's happening. What is the action or the reaction? Every knee should bow and every tongue can, should confess. What? Here we are back to exaltation. Glory that Jesus Christ is Lord. To what? The glory of God the Father. This is this movement. It comes like this and goes right up back like this. Humble mindset and then reaction that ultimately it ends up in unity. We are reconciled to God through the, the humility of Jesus. We are united perfectly as his people for all of eternity because of the glory that he shares with his Father. You know, it's, it's amazing. I'm, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You know, there's one thing everyone will agree on, at least at one point in all of eternity. It will be that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord. And so, what Jesus does here doesn't count equality with God. The movement starts. And it will continue. I think next week we're just going to look at each, each, each piece of this in verses 6 through 11. Because when you start to really pick it apart, it just, it's amazing. It's just amazing. We just, we, I spent a little bit of time with a couple people just reflecting on verse 6 yesterday. And so I, I, I started taking notes. I, I can't take credit for any of those thoughts because they, they were just great thoughts that were being shared. But, you know, the, 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 thing, the thing is, and, and this is where we'll finish. When we start to think about the humility of Jesus really driving our action, okay, Everyone will say, I, you know, like, how do I measure this? How do I measure my humility? Well, let's just go back to the example that we used before. How, how is it that we receive reproof? You know, what, what happens in our soul? And maybe, in, in other words, how long does it take for us? What is the span of time to where we ha have received correction, maybe begin, been confronted? Um, and then what is the, how long does it take to move away from thinking about the person who's given it and actually thinking about the thing that they're talking about. How long does that take? And then even from, you know, really dealing with that, how long does it take for us to start thinking about working on that particular area of life? I'll, I'll share one thing, and then we'll, we'll stop. I, a number of years ago, I, I remember being in a conversation with a, with a guy who was, um, you know, giving some criticism about the a ministry I was involved in. And I remember um, thinking, okay, He's, he just started in, and uh, he was on a roll. <laughs> he, had a, he had a lot to say. He must have been, like, listening to that song, Mama Said, Knock You Out, during, right before our conversation, because bam, bam, bam. And I thought to myself, as I'm listening to this, you know, he's kind of right <laughs> about some of these things. It was a Holy Spirit moment. Because I thought that I could either I can either argue, which I really wanted to do, or just say, you know, that's true. You're right. Yep, you got me again. I, I mean, I th I think what it did is it just took the teeth right out of the right like took the teeth right right out. Like I wasn't in for a fight. It was a it was a knockout. Because, and again, I think he's caught me on the right day. I, w I couldn't argue, and. I, I, take a gr I take a lot of joy in how one person characterized the Parkside Basics Pastors Conference. In one summary sentence, don't try this at home. Because when you think about the growth of the church, it's not about trying to duplicate whatever it is that God did in that place at that time in order to make your church just like that, but rather through a humble estimation of yourself. You say, you know, it's just God's grace at that moment that God did what he did. But that don't go trying to duplicate this because we don't know how that's going to go. And I, I, I'll t I tell you this story not because I want to put myself as the hero of the story. I'm not. You know why? Because I think about that conversation a lot. And you know what I come back to often? Oh, I should have said that. Oh, this really, w that would have been a doozy. Oh, I would have had him. I would have had him if I just said that. And so the battle gets lost. I mean, like, 
I thought the war was won that day, but there's like the residual battles that I lose all the time. Why? Because I'm still thinking about that conversation, how I could have bested them. And I got to keep coming back to it over and over and over again. That it's about the way I'm absorbing this criticism rightly. Whether, whether the source is right or not, it's irrelevant. It's a question of what, what is that information being passed? Whether, hey, look, I'll evaluate it. We can throw out some of the bad and keep some of the good, but the real question is how, what's happening in my own soul? That'll say a lot about my humility and the time gap that it takes me to get there. And even beyond that day, how do I think about people? How do I regard them? How do I count them? Christ-driven humility begins in your mind, but doesn't stay there. It's generated in action. And I think that's the point that Paul's making so that people in the Philippian church might be unified. Let me pray. Lord, we pray as a church that um, you'd help us to keep uh, the focus on the, the main thing, which is to do battle, uh, wage battle for uh, the purity of our souls and for the propagation of the gospel so that we might see people's lives changed and your glory extended through all the earth. And we pray, Lord, through our temptations to fracture and splinter and take what we think is ours to the detriment of people around us. And we pray that you would stop us and that, that you would help us, Lord, have the right estimation of our own souls. And so have uh, a more clear estimation of who you are and what you've accomplished for us. Pray that you would help us to do that today so that our bonds might be strengthened once again among one another. In Jesus' name, amen.